Who's got anointed feet this morning? Anointed feet, feet prepared for the gospel of peace. Everywhere we put the soles of our feet, God said, I'll give you that land. So we have anointed feet prepared for the gospel of peace. Well, it is a great pleasure. I think the last time I spoke at Coast Live was about 10 years ago. Back in the A-Frame Church, not so long ago, A-Frame. And uh, normally my wife would be with me, but she is um, stuck in New South Wales at the moment. In fact, has been for the last almost 12 weeks now. Cannot get back over the border. So uh, we've been working away, working away. I've been watching reruns of that great movie of Steve McQueen, The Great Escape. I've been taking notes. <laughs> so I think Steve McQueen rode a, rode a motorbike. I don't think I'd be riding it, jumping a motorbike. My wife would probably do that, but... But, um, but anyway, uh, appreciate your prayers. And uh, trust my wife will be back in Queensland, back home soon, sooner rather than later. But I have got uh, my younger son with me, Caleb, to come just give everybody a wave. So he was feeling sorry. Actually, I'm fortunate that Caleb actually knows how to cook. So while my wife's been away for 12 weeks or so, <laughs> Caleb's actually been preparing the meals. So it's, it, it's, um, it's been a blessing having Caleb around, that's for sure. He wants to move out of house. I said, you can't move out of house now until, until your mum gets back. <laughs> so we're going to be in trouble. But um, any, anyway, this morning I want to share on the message, um, Overcoming in the Battle. And I, let's carry on with that thought, having anointed feet, you know, prepared with the gospel of peace. Overcoming in the midst of the battle, and uh, the subject is, um, I was going to call it Job the Naked Soul. When you think of Job, everything was stripped away from, from, from Job. But uh, I thought I might call it Job the Overcomer. Because at the end of the day, Job went through a spiritual battle. Everything was stripped away from him, taken from him. But I find in the end of Job, chapter 41, chapter 42, when you get to the end of Job, Job was actually one who overcame. He overcame. He was still standing. The flag was still flying. Even through the midst of the battle, when it came to the very end, he was still standing. And so I want to read from the book of Job, chapter 1. Now, there's a little bit of reading. Normally, I would read so much, but it is a gripping story. And I'm sure most of us will know the story anyway. But from Job, chapter 1, I want to read the preamble here from verse 6. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence today. Thank you that you have anointed us. Your anointing is in this place, that you've anointed our feet. You've anointed our hands. Lord, you've anointed us for the work that you called us to do. Lord, I thank you and I praise you, Father, for your word will, will increase, multiply, and prevail in this place. In Maruchidor, Lord, across the Sunshine Coast, Lord, over the East Coast of Australia, from coast to coast, Lord, we thank you that your word will prevail. This is the day when your word will go forth and prevail. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Job chapter 1, verse 6, it says this. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan, or simply the accuser, or the adversary, also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, the accuser, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth from it, on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth? A blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. So Satan the accuser answered the Lord and said, Does God, does Job fear God? For now, this is an attack on Job's character now. An attack on his on his his reputation, his character. Verse 10, have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan the accuser, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now this is the story of what happens as the accuser goes out. Verse 13, now there was a day when the sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job. Said the oxen were ploughing and the donkeys feeding beside them. When the Sabaeans raided them and took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep 
And the servants and consumers and I alone have escaped to tell you. Goes on. While he was still speaking, also, another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three beings, raided the camels, and took them away, yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have uh, escaped to tell you. Yet again, while he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in the oldest brother's house, and suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Incredible story, isn't it? Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, he fell to the ground, worshipped, and he said, Naked I came. From my mother's womb, Job, the naked soul, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away, except, of course, Job never read the preamble, because it wasn't the Lord who stripped him and took it away. It was the accuser, the adversary, who took it all away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this, Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. Goes on. Bear with me. From chapter 2, again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and the accuser of Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? This is the test coming a second time now, the, the attack coming a second time. And he still holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him, destroy him without cause. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yes, all that a man has he will give for his life, but stretch out your hand now, touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. So Satan, the accuser, went out from the presence of the Lord, struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his feet to the crown of his head. And it says that Job here took himself a pot shirt. What is a pot shirt? It is, it is broken pottery. It's like a, a piece of ceramic that's been broken. And it's a bit of a picture here, isn't it? Because God is the potter. We are the clay. God makes Amen. vessels of honour and some vessels of dishonour. But here we see a vessel that has been smashed. Totally smashed. Like sometimes, sometimes I have a difficult day or a difficult week and I'll come home and tell my wife, I really feel smashed. You know, I had a tough day. But here we see Job, he's really been smashed. He's sitting amongst the broken pottery. That piece of ceramic tile, broken ceramic tile that he's holding in his hand, perhaps is a picture of his own life at this particular time. And then he says, and then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as the foolish woman speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and shall not accept adversity? And all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Always say, when your marriage gets to the stage where your partner is telling you to roll over and die, it's a good time to get some counselling. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> but it goes on here. Now, fortunately for Job, he had three friends. Verse 11 now. Job's three friends heard of all this adversity. So that Job, you know... And all his struggles, at least he had some support network with him, had three friends who turn up. And of course, the, you know the story, the three friends turn up and they started well because they sat with him and they didn't say anything for seven days. And I think if they had, after seven days, if they had have got up and gone home, it would have been okay. But of course, after seven days, they started, they had to share their views on Job's situation. Different words, you know, I think of the different words we speak. And, of course, there's words of comfort. I think Job was expecting words of comfort to come from his three friends. But there's not just words of comfort. There's words of correction. We can speak words of comfort, words of correction. And words of correction are good because we grow through words of correction. But there's also words of condemnation. And, you know, when I read through this discourse and discussion between Job and his friends, it begins with words of comfort but quickly ends up with words of condemnation. And I like to think, uh, if you took three highlighted pens, and I do a little bit of lecturing in classwork, so, you know, I'm thinking of, of classroom students, if you took three highlight pens, three different colours, uh, say a yellow colour for words of comfort, to mark all the words of comfort, say a green pen to, to mark all the words of correction, and then a red pen to mark all the words of condemnation. 
And you'd find if you go through those three highlight pens in the book of Job, it starts out with the yellow but very quickly turns red. I was thinking of Pauline's epistles. You know, if you did the same exercise for the Pauline epistles, I was thinking uh, 1 Corinthians. You look at 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians is actually it's a book of correction. There's certain things that Paul is correcting in the church, in the community of faith, in their behavior, and how they meet, and how they're supposed to conduct themselves. So it was predominantly 1 Corinthians was a book of correction, mostly green. But then you go to 2 Corinthians, and it's a book of comfort. It went from correction to comfort, encouraging the, the Corinthians. So then it's, it's predominantly yellow. But then it flips then, I notice, in Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians, it's predominantly a book of comfort and a book of encouragement. There's a lot of encouragement in Thessalonians. In other words, it's mostly yellow first Thessalonians. But when you get to Second Thessalonians, then it becomes correction. It's mostly green in Second Thessalonians as they begin to Paul begins to correct some of their theology. But if you go through Job, it starts off in the yellow, some green, but quickly moves to red. But of course, Job's friends have an issue. And the issue is this, that in Scripture, it is the righteous that prosper, and it's the wicked that perish. So what's happening here is Job and his friends are trying to reconcile the situation that Job is in as one who's suffering. Here Job has been stripped away of everything that he has. He's been stripped of his wealth. He's been stripped of his health. He's been stripped of his dignity. He's lost his family. What else is there to take? He's lost everything. Even though the scripture says the righteous prosper. In fact, if you just turn from Job and go to Psalms. Psalm 1, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Verse 3, it says, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. That brings forth its fruit in its season. Its leaf also shall not wither. Whatever he does shall prosper. That's the, way of the, the life of the righteous. Whatever they do shall prosper. And of course it says the ungodly are not so, they're like the chaff which the wind blows away. So you can see here, Job's friends are trying to reconcile what's happening here. You know, you can share Psalm 1 and preach it with conviction, but it's not going to do Job much good. So this is the thought form through Scripture. In fact, I was thinking the other day of the story of Jonah. How many have heard the story of Jonah? <laughs> There's only four chapters, one of the minor prophets. And... Um, you go through those four chapters, and the first chapter in Jonah, because you know the story how, how Jonah runs away from the call of God. God says, Jonah, I want you to go east to Nineveh and preach to that great city, but instead he heads west to Joppa with the view of he's going to go on a cruise through the Mediterranean. And of course, when you get to chapter 1 in Jonah, it tells the story in the narrative, it tells the story how Jonah paid his fare. It has that word paid his fare. And the theme in Jonah chapter 1 is that not only does he pay his fare, he's going to keep on paying and keep on paying and keep on paying because rebellion will always lead to loss. His Jonah, he's a fugitive. He's running from the call of God. He's running from the purposes of God. He's running from, from his, his calling as a prophet. And uh, you can see how he pays his fare and he gets, I imagine he finds his cabin on the ship and there's probably that little sign that says, do not disturb. Guaranteed, Jonah would have put that on his door if there was one. <laughs> do not disturb. But how do you know you're going to keep on paying? If you're going to run, you're going to keep on paying. And so uh, what happens is the ship then gets caught in a storm. And the sailors are concerned that the ship is going to sink. So the first thing they do, they go to the luggage. And they start throwing the luggage overboard. And I can see that everything that Jonah has is all his possessions in life. In his port, the luggage that he's brought with him in his swag, there it goes. He keeps on over on the other side, into the ocean. On the, over, he loses his port. There's nothing worse. There's nothing worse when you've gone on a long flight, a long trip somewhere. You're in the airport and you go to the baggage, luggage pickup area and you're standing there on the, waiting for the luggage to come through on your carousel and nothing turns up. It's nothing, nothing worse. I remember once when my wife and I were in this particular airport, we just come off a long flight, and we went to get our luggage from the travel, from the carousel, where the luggage comes through, and uh, I could see what looked like my luggage, but it was hard to tell, because the wheels were off it, the handle was off it, there was a 
the port was broken from, uh, there's a, there was a crack of the port from the top to the bottom sort of thing. I was thinking, boy, I wonder how much of the luggage is missing now. And uh, I don't know what they did with that, but I suspect that the, it was okay when it went onto the plane. It looked different when it came off. The only thing I could think of is when they're taking the, the luggage off the plane on the tarmac, that maybe the plane, the pilots accidentally just backed up over it. That's the only thing I could imagine how it could be in such poor shape. But the problem is, is that I st we still had a couple of flights to get home. And I didn't have time to buy another port, another bag. So I just found some tape and I taped it up and taped it up and taped it up. On. And so when we went into the next check-in, it looked like my luggage had come straight from the hospital. It was uh, bandaged up. We eventually got home. But you can see in the story of Job, he, he's, he lost it. Not only has he paid out his fare now, his luggage has gone over. And of course, we haven't got time for the whole story of Jonah, but of course, eventually gets to the stage where Jonah goes over. He keeps on paying. This time he pays with his life. He said, the only way we're going to get out of this is if you throw me over. Because this storm is really because I've run away from the purposes and the presence of God. And off he goes. And he says that he sinks to the bottom. He says he's on the bottom of the ocean and the seaweed's wrapping around. He said, I think, well, at least he would have found where his luggage was, <laughs> to the bottom. <laughs> and then we find, the next thing we find, that, that Jonah is praying, but he's praying from the place of Sheol. If you read it carefully, he's praying from Sheol. From the other side, he's praying from Sheol. And, and the, the amazing thing, although chapter 1, the theme of chapter 1 is rebellion leads to loss, the theme of chapter 2, thank goodness, is repentance leads to life. Yeah. Rebellion leads to loss. Repentance leads to life. He says, God, from Sheol, he's praying, said, God, I'll do what you called me to do. And then, of course, courtesy of a great fish, God brings him up from that watery grave. The third chapter, Jonah then, in obedience, goes to Nineveh. The theme of the third chapter is then obedience leads to fruitfulness. Because he follows the call of God, he goes to Nineveh, preaches at Nineveh, and there's a citywide revival like nothing else. Everyone's saved from the, from the greatest to the least. Everyone puts on sackcloth, repents, including the livestock. When you read the story, it's the cattle, it's the sheep, it's the camels, it's the pigs. I wonder what the Hebrew prophet Jonah thought about that. When the word of God came, even the livestock were more obedient than what he was. You know, it sends a message when your spirituality kind of drops a little bit lower particularly for a Hebrew, drops a little bit lower than the pig. But obedience leads to fruitfulness. And of course, the last chapter we find that it's mercy leads to mission, which is another message. But I want to say this. When you look at Jonah, it's the story of Psalm 1. Rebellion leads to loss. Repentance leads to life. Obedience leads to fruitfulness. Mercy leads to mission, chapter 4. And you can preach that with all conviction, but it's not going to bring much encouragement to the life of Job. Job, a righteous man before God, but something's either gone wrong here in the theology. And of course, the, the issue here what we have is what Job never realised, nor his friends, that there was another story here. There was something else taking place. They never read the preamble. They didn't know what was happening in the spirit realm. So the, so the message this morning is, how are we going to survive the spiritual attack? How are we going to overcome? And the first thing I want to say here, for Job to overcome, the first thing he had to get an understanding of who the enemy is. If you want to overcome in this battle, you need to understand who the enemy is. That we fight not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. And you go all the way now to Job chapter 41. We find that Job, at last, gets a, an insight, revelation of the enemy that he's dealing with. This is God is speaking. See, it's interesting when you go through scriptures. From Genesis, it starts with a serpent in chapter 3. But all the way in Revelation, God gives John the Apostle a vision and a picture of not a serpent, but a dragon. So it goes from a serpent from Genesis all the way to Revelation and you come to a dragon. The story of Job is a little bit similar. The beginning of Job, you get a picture of an accuser. But when you get to the end of Job, 
you come not to a dragon, but you come to a Leviathan. In fact, there's two beasts. There's a behemoth and a Leviathan. You go through the description of behemoth, and it, it looks like an animal that comes out of the jungles of Africa somewhere. But the Leviathan is something that comes from different worlds. It doesn't fit any description of any animal that we've ever experienced. And it goes, and so God gives, just like God gave John the Apostle a vision of the dragon in Revelation, now God gives Job here a vision, a revelation of this thing called a Leviathan. There's so many different pictures through history of what this Leviathan might be. I don't know if you've ever read the book Moby Dick. Has anybody heard the book? Read the book Moby Dick. Now, uh, I think it was Herman Melville was the author of Moby Dick, but in Moby Dick, he describes Leviathan in terms of, of a great fish, a great whale. Now, I know that Moby Dick did have a nasty streak, but it's not really fair to Moby Dick to compare him with Leviathan. There was a, there was a political philosopher in the 1600s, a guy called Thomas Hobbes, and he wrote a book called Leviathan. But for Thomas Hobbes, when he thought of a Leviathan, he thought of it as a political entity. He thought of it as a rogue state that had to be contained, that had to be managed. So the question is, what is this? What was the Leviathan that Job saw? You ready? So this is chapter 41. We get a great description, this whole chapter. It says, Can you draw out Leviathan with a hook? Or snare his tongue with a line which you lower? Can you put a reed through his nose? Or, pull, or pierce his jaw with a hook? Verse 7 goes on and says, Can you fill his skin with harpoons? Or his head with fishing spears? In other words, what God is saying here, here's a beast. Here is an animal. This Leviathan isn't going to be contained with conventional methods. I think Paul understood this picture when he said that our weapons are not carnal, but they are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. We're talking about anointed feet when you think of Ephesians chapter 6 and, and the, 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 the armour that God has given and equipped us with. You know, the battles of our warfare here, when you understand the adversary, we don't fight with flesh and blood, but it's a righteousness like a breastplate, it's faith like a shield, and it's the word of God as a sword, two-edged sword. It's a helmet of salvation. Understanding, number one, understanding the adversary. If you're, gonna, if you're going to overcome in this battle, to understand the adversary, it goes on here. Verses um, from three to six, it says, Will he make many supplications to you? Leviathan, will he speak softly to you? Will he make a covenant with you? Will you take him as a servant forever? In other words, what he's saying is, this is an animal and a beast that you can't appease. You can't enter into a covenant with this type of creature. Now, maybe Thomas Hobbes got it right when he thought of Leviathan as a political entity. I think of Neville Chamberlain, you know, in before the, the years of World War II. When he came back from Nazi Germany, he said there'll be peace in our time. Perhaps what he didn't realise is he was wrestling against a, a spiritual principalities and powers and a Leviathan that you can't appease. You know, some, there's some battles you can't appease this enemy here. You've just got to resist, stand up and resist. God has not called us to make covenants. He's called in the spirit. Realm, he's called us to stand and resist. To stand and resist. Here's a a beast and an enemy that you can't make covenant with. Goes on to say, I'm just picking some of these verses out for the sake of time, but verse 18 it says, His sneezing splash forth light, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning lights, sparks of fire shoot forth. In other words, from out of his mouth. How many know that the, the enemy is the accuser of brethren? The father of all eyes. And so we see here, out of, this, out of this beast comes forth destruction from his mouth. Goes on, verse 31, 32. Well, verse 24, it says, His heart is as hard as stone, even as hard as the lower millstone. 31, it says, He makes the deep 
boil like pot in, in Hebrew thinking, it's the chaos comes out of the waters. You know, think of uh, Daniel and the visions that Daniel had of the great beasts that came, but the great beasts come out of the water, they come out of the seas in Daniel chapter 7. It's out of the waters where the chaos is. But here's this beast, he makes the waters boil like a pot. Verse 34, he beholds every high thing and his king over all the children of pride. I think the first Peter says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith. Now we find here, in all the midst of the struggles, the first thing Job comes to is a revelation to understand that he's fighting something he has no idea what is. He's, he's got, all of a sudden, he's got an insight that he's dealing with principalities and powers that he's never considered before. It's almost like God gives him a vision of a different realm. That this battle is not on this realm, it's in a different realm altogether. Number one, if we're going to spy the battle, overcome the battle, understand the adversary. So it goes on. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything, and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. He said, I will question you, and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. And it says, therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. The second thing I see here is Job the sinner. Job recognises that, you know, Job had a great heart. He had a lot of questions, but when he came to a revelation that he was outside the realm of God's will, he was quick here to respond and repent. And I think the second thing, if we're going to overcome in the midst of the battle, we've got to put on the righteousness of Christ. You know that verse that says the righteous are as bold as a lion? Lord, in this battle you need to be as bold as a lion. The righteous are as bold as a lion. Job recognised the sinner, but boy, he was quick to put on that righteous, to repent and find that place of righteousness. I think of James chapter 5, verse 17. The, the effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Of a righteous person availeth much. Number two, put on the righteousness of Christ. The third thing, as we wrap up very quickly here, if we're going to overcome in this battle, it says, so it was in verse 7. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, that the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is aroused against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job. Job the sinner, now Job the servant. And what I love about this is that in chapter 1 of Job, God calls and refers to Job as my servant. On the other end of the battle, on the other side of the fight, God comes back and reaffirms, Job, my servant. Now, Job had a lot of questions in the midst of when he was stripped of everything that he had. He had a lot of questions, but I find this, that Job had a lot of questions, he always maintained his confession of faith. And in the midst of the battle, he said this, I know my Redeemer lives. You take from me... Take my family, take my health, take my wealth, take my dignity. But I know my Redeemer lives. And in the end, He will stand and I will see Him. Amen. They, couldn't take, they could take everything, but they couldn't take the confession of His faith. I know my Redeemer lives. And at the end of the battle, you know, it's one thing to be God's servant before the battle. But I found it's another thing to be still God's servant at the end of the, on the other side of the battle. I find here at the end of the battle, the flag was still flying. The dawn of the early light, when the smoke began to clear from the battles of the night, I looked and saw the flag was still flying on the other side of the battle. True? I wrote a poem and a song about that. Star Spangled Banner, that's the story. The American anthem. But it's the story of Job. You know, if we're going to overcome, number one, understand the adversary. Put on the righteousness of Christ. Maintain our confession of faith. But it goes on. And it says here that um, 
It says, it says here how Job then prayed. I'm trying to pick up the verse. It says, verse 10, And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. So here we find Job now, the intercessor. Job, the sinner, put on the righteousness of Christ. Job, the servant, maintain your confession of faith. But now we find Job, the intercessor, the one who prayed for those who persecuted him. And if we're going to win this battle, if you're going to overcome in your battle, you've got to pray for those who persecute you. You've got to be a prayer, an assessor, not just for those that are your friends and your family, which, you know, a constant prayer. It's easy to pray. I find it's easy to pray for my friends. It's easy to pray for Pastor Patrick. He's my friend. It's easy to pray for family. It's a lot more challenging to pray for those who spitefully use me. But listen, that's where the victory is. You know, Job got his heart right. Righteousness of Christ, maintained his confession of faith, prayed for his enemies. And finally, we find here that Job is also the beneficiary. Verse 12, Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. It says he had 14,000 sheep. You go to Job chapter 1 verse 3 and he had 7,000 sheep. You go to the last part of the chapter, he's got 14,000 sheep. It goes on further and says... Um, where, where are we? 14,000 sheep. He had 14,000 sheep. He had 6,000 camels. You go to Job chapter 1, beginning of the story, and he had 3,000 camels. Now he's got 6,000 camels. 1,000 yoke instead of 500. 1,000 female ducks instead of 500. Goes, in other words, he had a double portion. God gave him a double portion. But the final thing I find about Job, in his ability to overcome the battle, that Job was grateful. Job the beneficiary. If we're going to win this battle, number one, know your, know your adversary, the accuser. Put on the righteousness of Christ, Job the sinner. Maintain your confession of faith, Job the servant. Pray for those who persecute you, Job the intercessor. And ultimately be thankful and grateful, Job the beneficiary. When God pulls out his blessing. But of course, you know, when you look at the story of Job, it's really incomplete without the gospel, isn't it? Because Job is just a picture of another righteous one who suffers. You think of Jesus, the righteous one who suffered. Now, Job is the story at the very beginning in chronological in the chronologic of, of Israel's storytelling and culture and narrative. Quite likely, Job was the very first story. Predates the law. Planted in the very mind of the of the Hebrew people is this idea that there is a case, although the law is the righteous shall prosper, there's an exception here that sometimes there's a righteous one who has suffered. The Redeemer, Job's mediator, and ultimately the dragon slayer. Let me just finish off one favourite verse. Am I allowed to do that? Yes. I've probably gone on a little bit too long. But uh, I just want to turn one favourite verse. It doesn't even need any commentary. You just read it and feel the impact of it. And this is Isaiah, the major prophet Isaiah, chapter 27, one verse to finish off on. In that day, in that day, the Lord with his severe sword and great and strong, great and strong, his sword great and strong, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent. Leviathan, that twisted serpent, and he will slay that reptile, the reptile that is in the sea. And praise God for that. Jesus comes as the dragon slayer. It's the re revelation that John got in the book of Revelation of the dragon being overcome. But here it is, Leviathan. That reptile comes from the, the chaos of the seas. But one day the throne is going to be established and that sea is going to be like a sea of glass. The chaos will be taken away. It'll no longer be boiling again. It will be like a sea of glass when God's throne is established. Amen. So we're going to finish off on that. But how about, um, how about we stand and let me pray for people today. I want to pray particularly for those who are going through times of battle. You might be going, now we are in a time of surreal time, but a time of challenge, aren't we? We're going through, whether you've separated from family, people have suffered health wise, have suffered financially. I just want to pray over yourself, over your family, 
and over this community, that God will be with us in the battle. Who can say with me, I know my Redeemer lives. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you for the confession of faith. We say today, I know my Redeemer lives. Lord, you will stand. You stand with us today. Your presence is with us. Lord, we're not a fugitive today from your presence, but we come to you. We put on the righteousness of Christ. We thank you, Father, Lord, for the faith, the gift of faith. Be activated today in our hearts and our lives. Lift up our vision, Lord, that we might be able to prosper in these days, to overcome in these days. And Lord, I pray for every single person here. Lord, those who have gone through times of challenges, whether it's health, whether it's wealth, whether it's family, Lord, whatever the matter might be, Father, I believe right now for your intervention, for your spiritual equipping. Lord, I thank you, Father, for the ability to stand and having done all to stand. Lord, to keep on standing. Lord, I thank you that you're calling this church today to stand. Keep on standing. You've been standing. God, say, keep on standing. Keep on standing. Lord, I thank you that you've equipped us for everything that we need. Lord, I thank you for your equipping over this place. I thank you for your word will prosper, increase, multiply, and prevail. Lord, that your word will be mighty on the lips, Lord, of your people here today. Lord, speaking words of life or words of deliverance. And Lord, I speak life and deliverance over every person, every household, every family. Lord, extended family members. Lord, I, I speak victory, Father, in health realms, in financial realms. Lord, we thank you today. We stand upon your word. Lord, the battle might be long and it might be hard, but you are mighty. Lord, you've equipped us to be mighty. And Father, we stand here as overcomers, victorious in you. Thank you, Father. Lord, for your blessing today, for impartation over every home, every person. Your impartation, Father. Lord, I thank you that we'll stand and keep on standing as you've called us to. Lord, we'll prove faithful, Lord, in the end. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Receive it this morning.